Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to look at how to evaluate definite integrals. So in this section, we're going to look at what's called the evaluation theorem, and we're going to be able to determine the area bounded by a function using an antiderivative. We're going to be able to find an indefinite integral of a function in the next video. We will also study the inverse relationship between integration and differentiation. And then also in the next video, we'll look at how to determine the net area of a function over a closed interval, and also use the net change theorem in terms of distance and displacement of a particle in motion. So let's start with evaluating definite integrals. We've actually evaluated definite integrals in previous videos when the definite integral gave us an area that we could use a simple geometric formula to find the area bounded by the curve. However, that method cannot be used whenever the curve of the function does not form a geometric figure such as a rectangle, triangle, trapezoid, or even semicircle. So Sir Isaac Newton discovered a simple method for evaluating integrals a few years later after Leibniz made the discovery. So originally Leibniz made the discovery, but then Newton actually published the work. Both mathematicians realized they could find the value of this definite integral from x equals a to x equals b as the limits of integration. f of x is the integrand and x is the variable integration. If they knew an antiderivative, capital F of x, of the integrand. So in other words, if you just know one antiderivative, Newton and Leibniz both figured out that you can find out the value of the definite integral to give you the area under the curve. This is called the evaluation theorem, or other people usually call it the fundamental theorem of calculus version one. So the fundamental theorem of calculus, and it was first discovered by Newton and Leibniz, and we'll talk more about the fundamental theorem of calculus, the second version in the next section. So let's start with the evaluation theorem and see what it actually states. You have a function that is continuous, on a closed interval, a, b. So then you can evaluate the definite integral from x equals a to x equals b of the integrand, f of x, where x is a variable of integration by finding an antiderivative, capital F, of the integrand, evaluate it at the upper limit of integration, which is x equals b, then subtract, take the antiderivative, and evaluate at the lower limit of integration, which is x equals a. Subtract those two values, and you'll find out the area under the curve bounded by the function f of x between x equals a and x equals b and the x-axis. So this f of b, f of a, it's using f of x, which is any antiderivative of the integrand. And remember, that antiderivative means if you take the derivative of the antiderivative, you just get the integrand, lowercase f of x. So there are a couple steps with the evaluation theorem and why it's so important is that it tells you a very simple way to calculate the definite integral of a function over a closed interval by just doing two steps. Find an antiderivative, capital F of X, of the integrand. Once you have an antiderivative, you evaluate the expression at the upper limit of integration first the lower limit of integration second, and subtract them in that order. f of b, subtract f of a. And keep in mind, I keep saying an antiderivative because it does not matter what antiderivative capital F of x of the integrand you use in the evaluation theorem. All right, now that we know what the evaluation theorem says, let's try example one. Evaluate the following definite integrals. So we're going to do several of these problems. So number one, we're going to find the value of the definite integral from x equals 1 to x equals 2 of x squared subtract 3, and the variable of integration is x. So remember, the first step in the evaluation theorem is to find an antiderivative. So find the antiderivative of each term. Antiderivative of x squared is 1 third x cubed, and the antiderivative of 3x is 3x. And now we want to evaluate at x equals 1 and x equals 2. 
So remember that the upper limit of integration is evaluated in the expression for the integer first. So 1 third times 2 cubed subtract 3 times 2. That's the answer when we, sub when we substitute in x equals 2. And now substitute in x equals 1. 1 third times 1 cubed subtract 3 times 1. And if you evaluate this, you'll find out the value is negative 2 thirds. So in other words, the area under the curve bounded by the x-axis and the vertical lines x equals 1 and x equals 2, the value is negative 2 thirds. So let's try another problem, number 2. This time the definite integral will be from x equals 1 to x equals 4 of 2 thirds times the square root of x minus 4 divided by x squared and the variable of integration is x again. So before we find the antiderivative, rewrite the integrand so it's 2 thirds x to the half subtract 4 x to the negative 2 dx. So now find the antiderivative of each term separately. So keep the coefficient, so 2 thirds. Now this is the reverse power rule, so add 1 to the exponent, so 3 halves, and then also divide by 3 halves. So there's the integer of the first term, and then the second term, keep the negative 4, add 1 to the exponent, so it makes it x of negative 1, and then also divide by negative 1, and now evaluate when x equals 1 and x equals 4. Alright, so before we substitute in the values x equals 1 and x equals 4, Let's simplify the antiderivative. 2 thirds times the reciprocal of 3 halves is 2 thirds times 2 thirds x to the 3 halves. And then notice that the second term will become plus 4x to the negative 1 and evaluate at x equals 1 and x equals 4. So we'll have 4 ninths x to the 3 halves and then plus 4x to the negative 1. So let's evaluate this at x equals 4 first. So we'll have 4 ninths times 4 to the 3 halves plus 4 times 4 to the negative 1. Get that answer when you substitute in 4, and now subtract the answer when you substitute in 1. So 4 ninths times 1 to the 3 halves plus 4 times 1 to the negative 1. And if you evaluate this, you'll find out it's 139 divided by 36. So keep your answer as a fraction. Do not change it to a decimal unless it says to do so. So let's try a third problem, number 3. This time we'll have the definite integral from x equals 0 to natural log of 2. 3e to the 4x dx. So again, let's find the antiderivative. So keep the coefficient 3. The antiderivative of an exponential function is itself, so e to the 4x. But notice that if you took the derivative of the exponent using the chain rule, you have to divide by 4 to cancel out the derivative of the exponent also being 4. So then evaluate this at x equals 0 and natural log of 2. So you'll have 3 fourths e to the 4 times natural log of 2 and then subtract when you substitute in x equals 0, so 3 fourths e to the 4 times 0. So now you can rewrite the first term using a logarithm property. The coefficient can be rewritten to be 3 fourths e to the natural log of 2 to the 4th power. Subtract 3 fourths times e to the 0, which will just be 1. So we'll have 3 fourths times e to the natural log of 16 subtract 3 fourths times 1, which is 3 fourths. e to the natural log of 16 is just 16. And so 3 fourths times 16 subtract 3 fourths will simplify to 45 fourths. And that's the area under the curve. e to the 4x times 3 from x equals 0 to x equals natural log of 2 and the x-axis. Okay, number four. This time we'll have the definite integral from zero to one of three divided by one plus x squared in the denominator dx. 
So again, notice that the 3 is just a coefficient. So you can rewrite this as integral from 0 to 1, 3 times the fraction 1 plus x squared in the denominator, dx. And this, if you notice that the integrand 1 divided by 1 plus x squared, the antiderivative is arctan, or inverse tangent. So we'll keep the 3 as a coefficient. The antiderivative is inverse tangent of x. And then we'll, we'll evaluate x equals 0 and x equals 1. So this becomes 3 times inverse tangent of 1. Subtract 3 times inverse tangent of 0. So 3 times the inverse tangent of 1. This is asking what angle is tangent 1? Well, it's pi over 4 in quadrant 1. And then subtract 3 times inverse tangent of 0. It's what angle is tangent 0? radians, and it's also 0. So you'll have 3 pi divided by 4. That's the area under the curve. 3 divided by 1 plus x squared from x equals 0 to x equals 1 using the evaluation theorem. Okay, number 5. Let's look at the integral from 0 to pi divided by 2 of cosine of x dx. So this one should be very quick because the antiderivative of cosine of x is just simply sine of x. And then evaluate at x equals 0 and x equals pi over 2 after you have the antiderivative. Always evaluate the antiderivative at the upper limit of integration first and then subtract the antiderivative evaluate at the lower limit of integration. It has to be in that order. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, sine of 0 is 0, and so the area under the curve, cosine of x, between 0 and pi over 2 and the x-axis is 1. Alright, number 6. Let's try the integral, this time from negative pi divided by 4 to 0, of secant of x tangent of x, and then dx. So again, this antiderivative should be very quick to find, because the antiderivative of secant of x tangent of x is secant of x, and then we're going to evaluate at x equals negative pi over 4, and x equals 0. So 0 goes in first. So secant of 0. Subtract so secant of negative pi divided by 4. Well, secant of 0 it would be 1 divided by cosine of 0, which just is 1. And then again, secant of negative pi over 4 would be 1 divided by cosine of negative pi over 4. So it's 1 subtract 2 divided by square root of 2 which simplifies to 1 subtract square root of 2. So you can leave your answer as this form, or if you simplify or approximate, it would be approximately negative 0.414 if it says to round to three decimal places. So that would be the approximate area under the curve secant of x times tangent of x between negative pi over 4 and x equals 0, and also the x-axis. Okay, number 7. Let's try to find the area under the curve from x equals 0 to 2 of 2x squared. Subtract 3x plus 2 dx. So notice that the integrand is entirely enclosed in parentheses. So we're going to find the antiderivative of the entire polynomial by finding the antiderivative of each term separately. So the antiderivative of 2x squared would be 2x cubed divided by 3. Subtract the antiderivative of 3x would be 3x squared divided by 2, and the antiderivative of 2 would be 2x. Evaluate at x equals 2 and x equals 0. So substitute in x equals 2 first. So 2 times 2 cubed divided by 3. Subtract 3 times 2 squared all divided by 2 plus 2 times 2, and then we'll have this answer entirely subtracted from when you substitute in 0. So 2 times 0 cubed divided by 3. Subtract 3 times 0 squared divided by 2 plus 2 times 0. So notice that entire second term, the second answer when we plug in x equals 0, will just be 0. So 0, 0, 0. So we'll have to worry about that second set of parentheses at all. We'll just have the first set of parentheses. So 2 times 8 divided by 3 will be 16 thirds. Subtract 
2 squared is 4, times 3 is 12, divided by 2 is 6, and then plus 4. So this will we'll find out that the area under the curve is 10 thirds for this polynomial function from x equals 0 to x equals 2. Okay, let's try three more problems using the evaluation theorem. So number 8, we're going to find the area under the curve from x equals 0 to pi divided by 4, and the function is 1 plus cosine squared theta divided by cosine squared theta, and the variable integration this time is theta, not dx. So notice that there are two terms in the numerator. So let's separate this up from 0 to pi over 4 for the definite integral. 1 divided by cosine squared theta plus cosine squared theta divided by cosine squared theta. So just take this integrand and rewrite it into two different fractions using the same LCD. But then we can use a definite integral property to rewrite this into two separate definite integrals, both going from 0 to pi over 4 for the limits of integration. So 1 divided by cosine squared of theta, d theta, plus, notice that the second integrand just simplifies to 1. Or you can just leave that out and just say 1 d theta. So now we're going to find the integer of each term. So this will be 0 to pi over 4. And it looks like 1 divided by cosine squared is secant squared, theta, d theta. And the other integral is 0 to pi over 4 of 1 d theta. So the integer of secant squared is tangent of theta, evaluated at theta equals 0 and theta equals pi divided by 4. So we evaluate once we have the antiderivative. So the integer of secant squared was tangent. The integer of 1 where the variable is theta it would be theta and evaluate at theta equals 0 and theta equals pi divided by 4. So the first integral, substitute in pi over 4 first, tangent of pi over 4, subtract tangent of the lower limit of integration, which is 0, get this answer, and then add the other answer when you plug in pi over 4 for theta, and then subtract when you substitute in 0 for theta. So we'll evaluate this first set of parentheses. Tangent of pi over 4 is 1. Tangent of 0 is 0, so 1 minus 0. Plus the other integral is pi over 4 subtract 0. So it looks like it's 1 plus pi divided by 4. That's perfectly fine. Or if you want to have common denominators, you'll have 4 plus pi all divided by 4. That would be the area under the curve. 1 plus cosine squared theta, all divided by cosine squared theta, from theta equals 0 to theta equals pi over 4, and the x-axis. Okay, number 9. This time the integral is from 1 to 9 of 1 divided by 2x dx. So again, just like the last problem, you may want to rewrite the integrand so that you can see that the coefficient is really 1 half. So integral from 1 to 9 of 1 half times 1 divided by x dx. This way you can see what the integrand is, so you can find the antiderivative very quickly. 1 half is a coefficient, so it will stay in the antiderivative, and the antiderivative of 1 divided by x is natural log absolute value of x. So this is the antiderivative. Evaluate at x equals 1 and x equals 9. So you'll have 1 half natural log of absolute value of 9, subtract natural log absolute value of 1, and also times a half. So then notice that 1 and 9 are both positive, so you can really drop the absolute value now. So natural log of just 9, subtract 1 half natural log of 1, and natural log of 1 is 0. So that second term just disappears, and it's 1 half times natural log of 9. And you can leave your answer like this, that's fine. Or if you want to use a logarithm property, you can simplify a little bit further. The 1 half can be brought to an exponent, which makes it natural log of 9 to the half, which is natural log of 3. So that would be the area under the curve, the exact area, from x equals 1 to 9 of 1 divided by 2x. All right, let's try one more. And this one will be a little bit more work because it's 
function, the integrand, is an absolute value. So we'll have integral from 0 to 2, absolute value 2x minus 1 dx. So there's a couple things that we need to notice. Notice that 2x minus 1 will equal 0 when x is equal to a half, and x equals a half is contained in the closed interval. for the integrals from 0 to 2. So, we will need to divide the integral into two integrals. Over the intervals 0 to a half and the other integral will be from 1 half to 2. Okay, that's one observation. The other observation that we need to make is that the absolute value function is really a piecewise function. So absolute value of 2x minus 1 is the same function, 2x minus 1, if x is greater than or equal to a half. So if x is a half or larger, this value will be positive, and so Absolute value 2x minus 1 is just 2x minus 1. Otherwise, the function becomes the opposite sign, so opposite of 2x minus 1 if x is less than a half. So right now we have the integral from 0 to 2, absolute value 2x minus 1, and the variable of integration is x. We're going to divide this up into two integrals. One integral will go from 0 to half of absolute value 2x minus 1 and the other integral will go from 1 half to 2 of the same function. So this is using the additivity rule for definite integrals. You can break up an integral into two separate integrals as long as one area ends where the other area begins. So now we're going to use the observation about the piecewise function. If the x values are between 0 and a half, the absolute value of 2x minus 1 would be the opposite of 2x minus 1. This is integral from 0 to a half of the opposite of 2x minus 1 dx. The other integral, the x values are between a half and 2, so the x values are larger than a half, so the function is 2x minus 1. And the variable integration on both integrals is x, so make sure that both integrals have a dx. So now we're ready to find the antiderivative and use the evaluation theorem. So keep the coefficient negative 1, find the antiderivative, antiderivative of 2x is 2x squared divided by 2, or just x squared, and the antiderivative of negative 1 would be negative x. Evaluate at x equals 0 to x equals a half. Plus, for the second integral, find the antiderivative again, so the antiderivative would be 2x squared divided by 2, subtract x and evaluate this integral from x equals a half to x equals 2. So just be very careful with your signs because it's very easy to miss a minus sign or a negative sign. That will cause the area to be an, um, incorrect. So the opposite of x squared subtract x from x equals 0 to x equals a half. So we're going to simplify before we start substituting the upper and lower limits of integration plus x squared subtract x, integral from x equals half to x equals 2. All right, first integral, substituting in a half, so opposite of 1 half squared, subtract 1 half. Get this answer, and subtract when you substitute in 0. So 0 squared, subtract 0, and it's all this with a negative sign in front plus. Second integral would be from 2 squared, subtract 2, and then get this answer and subtract when you substitute in a half. So 1 half squared, subtract 1 half. So if you simplify, you'll find out that set of parentheses will be opposite of 1 fourth 
subtract a half. This is zero, so ignore it. Plus two squared minus two will just give you two. Subtract one half squared is one fourth again, and then subtract a half inside the parentheses. So opposite of one fourth, negative a fourth, plus a half, plus two, subtract a fourth, and plus a half. And you'll find out that the area under the curve of the absolute value of 2x minus 1 from x equals 0 to x equals 2 turns out to be 5 halves. Or 2.5 if you change it to a decimal. So this gives you an idea of how to use the evaluation theorem. You always find the antiderivative first, then you substitute in the upper limit of integration, and then subtract your answer from the lower limit of integration when you plug that in. So the next thing we're going to talk about is where does this idea of an area under the curve come from and using definite integrals. Well, a French mathematician first found the area under the sine and cosine functions back in 1635. It was a very challenging problem and it required a lot of ingenuity. And then when Leibniz and Newton came about and used um, the definite integral and the evaluation theorem, the problems became much easier in the 1660s and the 1670s. So the two steps are always find the antiderivative and then evaluate at the limits of integration. Upper limit first and then the lower limit second. Luckily, there's a way that you can find out the area under the curve using a graphing utility. So we're going to use a TI-83 or a ti 4 to determine the value of the area bounded by a curve of a continuous function on a closed interval. So in other words, we're going to find out the value of a definite integral from x equals a to x equals b of some function f of x, which will be a curve, and the variable of integration will be x. So grab your calculators. We're going to follow the steps that are in the notes. So the graphing calculator screens are on the right side, and we're also going to do it together. So the first thing we're going to do is you can actually visualize what the area under the curve is by graphing the function. So go to y equals, enter in the function 2x cubed, subtract 6x plus 3 divided by parentheses x squared plus 1 in the denominator. So make sure the denominator is enclosed in parentheses. So we're going to find the area under the curve of 2x cubed minus 6x plus 3 divided by x squared plus 1. Now the next step, we're going to make sure that we um, visualize the area under over a certain closed interval. Let's go to window. Let's set up the x values to go from x equals 0 to x equals 2 for the maximum. Count the x tick marks by 1. The y values go to negative 5 to positive 5 and also count the y tick marks by 1. So if you have this window, the next step is to graph. So the next step is to hit graph so you can figure out what the area under the curve looks like for the function. We're going from x equals 0 to x equals 2 for the window. If you want to find out the area under the curve, you go to second and then the trace button. You'll see calc, so that's calculate with a graph. You may have seen some of these earlier in the class or pre-calculus. So value zero, minimum, maximum, intersection point, derivative, we've done earlier in the class. And now we want option number seven, which is integral f of x dx, which is for definite integrals. So select option number seven. The calculator is going to ask you, what is your lower limit of integration? So we want x equals zero. So enter in zero and hit enter. The calculator will give you an, um, a y value at x equals 0, the y value is 3. What's your upper limit of integration? We're going to go to x equals 2. So type in 2, hit enter, and then the calculator will start to shade in the area bounded by the curve and the x-axis between x equals 0 and x equals 2. And it will also calculate the area as approximately negative 0.678554 on this interval from 0 to 2. So I like this feature. It actually shows me the visualization of the area I'm finding. Keep in mind that we found out in the last video 
that if the area is above the x-axis, it's considered positive, a positive value. And if the area is below the x-axis, it's considered a negative value. So this has a negative answer on the definite integral, meaning there's more area below the x-axis than if you added those two areas above. So you can see in the notes that we have exactly found the approximation of this definite integral from x equals 0 to x equals 2 of our function with the variable of integration is x, and we found out the approximate area. However, there is another way you can actually find the definite integral's value without actually using a graph. So with your graphing calculator, if you go to second, quit, and go back to the home screen, there is evaluation of definite integrals underneath the math menu, so math, and then sc scroll down to number nine. This is function integration, so hit that function. If you have a newer operating system on your calculator, the operating system will give you a blank palette where you can enter in the lower limit and upper limit of integration, your integrand, and your vari variable of integration. So we're going to evaluate from x equals 0, scroll up to x equals 2, scroll to the right. The integrand was our function, which was 2x to the third power, subtract 6x plus 3 divided by parentheses around the denominator, x squared plus 1, and parentheses around the denominator again. Scroll to the right, and now it's asking what's your variable of integration? Well, it's x, and then hit enter. So rather than graphing and having the um, area shaded by the graphing calculator, it can just return the area approximation. So approximately negative 0 0.67855384466. Or so same answer as we found when we did this with the, with the graph. So this will be a good place to stop our first video on evaluating definite integrals. If you have any questions about how to use the evaluation theorem on to determine the value of a definite integral using its antiderivative and the limits of integration, please let me know. Or if you have any questions about using the graphing calculator on how to approximate the area under the curve, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about indefinite integrals and applications.